So, our kind of almost final session of the day is going to be a really rather interesting panel. Now, how many of you here have uh, watched Raw Code and in particular Clustered before? We've got some people who are familiar with Clustered. So, it's a really great like YouTube show where people break Kubernetes clusters and people try to figure out how those clusters were broken and fix them. So we've been doing, uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've had uh, some teams fixing and some broken Kubernetes clusters using eBPF tooling. And so our panel today is going to be hosted by David Flanagan, also known as Raw Code, who is the host of Clustered. And we have a panel with representatives of our three teams who uh, fixed those clusters. We're going to learn about how they used these eBPF tools to solve problems that are representative of real world problems. So we have David, we have Duffy Cooley, we have Marga Monterola, and we have Loris Dijan. I'm going to get your name right, Dejiani. It's <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Sorry, Loris. <laughs> okay. Sorry? Okay, there's going to be a, a couple of minutes here to uh, just, I think, get the screen sorted out and mics. And oh, we've got lots of microphones. That's good. Yeah. So I guess once the microphones arrive, maybe we can start with Loris and have the speakers just introduce themselves. How about that? Yeah, uh, my name is Loris De Giovanni. I'm uh, the CTO and founder of uh, Sysdig. Uh, Sysdig is a company that uh, does uh, security and visibility for modern cloud-based containerized uh, applications. I'm uh, also one of the early contributors to Wireshark, the network analyzer and uh, one of the also creators of uh, Falco, the open source tool. So a career in open source uh, and uh, kernel hacking. I'm Duffy Cooley. I'm a field CTO at Isovalent, and I've also been working on in SIG cluster lifecycle on KubeADM and, and kind of helping people fix and break clusters for quite some time. So this is a really fun thing for me to be a part of. Uh, I'm Marga Manterola. I'm part of the Kingfolk team at Microsoft, leading the team that does Inspector Gadget, which is an eBPS tool for Kubernetes for figuring out when the cluster isn't working as expected, which is really fitting for when you're trying to fix a broken cluster. Hello. Hello. Whoa. Uh, hello. My name is David Flanagan. Uh, I go by Raw Code, and uh, I'm excited to have this panel. So, we had slides. Okay, we're good. So, let me fill you in a little bit for the people that are not familiar with what Clustered is. I, I often call it the worst idea I ever had. Um, having people break Kubernetes clusters and then live streaming fixing them is extremely stressful, but also a very valuable learning experience. And we have two different versions of Clustered. One is solo edition, where it's just one community member and another community member. And we also experiment with Teams editions. And I'm always looking for new victims, so feel free to reach out to me. I also want to thank Equinix Metal. They provide the hardware for the three clusters that we are going to watch get fixed today. So we've got Teams. We've already done the introduction, so we'll skip by this. And I want to just say before we show the videos that this is not easy. So I want to thank everyone involved, the breakers and the fixers. Like uh, being given a cluster and you have no idea what is wrong with it is uh, intimidating and stressful, but they all absolutely smashed it. So well done. Uh, and all of the tools that we're going to see today to debug and fix these clusters are open source. So this is stuff that you can play with and experiment in your own time as well. All right, so we've got our first video, and this is our isovalent cluster. Oh, we don't have audio. Can we get audio?
Duffy is just going to do the voiceover while the video is playing if the audio doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, it's so fun. It's so fun. Looks like you're there frozen on the screen. <laughs> that's definitely my that's definitely definitely my troubleshooting face. We, these clusters were broken by Tom Gra by Thomas Graf and a few other folks from Isovalent, and so I was definitely expecting some very interesting breaks. Yeah, for sure. I don't know how nice your colleagues were with you. Mine, mine were very nasty. Oh, were they? <laughs> <coughs> well, one of the problems that one, one of the problems in our cluster that we'll talk about here in a second was uh, was obviously a DNS problem because you know it always comes down to DNS. It's some always point. DNS. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then another one we thought that we had fixed it, but it was a decoy problem. Like you get past that problem, and you're like, no, it's still no, it still isn't working. Yeah. Should be fun. Is it working now? No. So we're starting off by just you know taking a look at what's happening inside the cluster. We're just trying to see what's happening, and we can see that initially we see that there is a pod that isn't up and running, and we're trying to figure out like why that pod isn't running, and we find a very important init container that is basically keeping it from ru from running by trying to make a connection to Google.com as a pre-check for the container. So until that init container happens, it won't start up. Is your mic? Hello? Yeah? yeah. Hmm. That's what he's doing. I, I can keep narrating, I guess. Yeah, the narration was actually <laughs> pretty interesting. Yeah. I don't think I recall what was broken with our cluster <laughs> to narrate it. Uh, I guess we can describe what's happening. Yeah, I guess I'll keep going with the narration. Yeah. So we were, you know, our the goal of our of our efforts is is to make it so that that container that we're re referencing here is able to come up and that we're able to see like a success image on the website that is being hosted by this container. And so, first we try to figure out like what was happening with the um, with Google.com, and we eventually came to the conclusion that what was happening was that. Um, Someone had actually put Google.com into the Etsy hosts file, pointing at like some other, you know, URL, and so it was never going to actually resolve because it was okay, it was against some. I think it was against localhost or something, and so that was actually probably one of the more creative DNS problems that I've seen in a while because basically it was just intercepting it, since Core DNS was using the hosts file to determine what the what the result of Google.com was. And <clears throat> at that point, we started moving on to the second set of problems. And the second set of problems, actually, I think we're still talking about the DNS one here. So we're trying to figure out like what the problem was. And we had a policy that would allow for um, us to communicate to Google.com, but for some reason, it wasn't resolving. And so we were trying to figure out why it wasn't resolving. And the reason was because of the host file, which was very clever. Thank you. Thank, thank you, breaking team, for that one. Finger crossed. <laughs> that FTDN lookup should be allowed. Your idea is that the init container is going to use the host's DNS. Okay, let services. me restart this then. Team Eyes of Valent, best of luck. Take it away. All right. 
So let's look around this thing and see what we got. Yay. Oh, got some Prometheus yeah, Something's stuff. not running. Two two Come on, computer. Uh, <laughs> okay, <I'm> so <laughs> so in it container is not ready. And this in it container has a very important name of probe do not delete. So this special version of cluster to just for team isovalent must be able to reach Google before it can start the clustered application. Given that we are so, a networking you know, plug in, maybe there is a networking problem here we need to look at. That looks oh, good. This is nice. Yeah. yeah. Everything's running. Yeah, it tells us that and we Hubble have, is already have a UI. Going. We have a, a UI running, so and we have Hubble running, so we can use Hubble. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. um, but if we yeah. rewind a bit, so we had this init container and it was not in red state. And I believe it was doing ping google.com. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering uh, it should use the host resolver. So even if the core DNS was not functioning, like if it was not able it to connect to QPA. So I see here we've got the rule that allows anything to reach cube DNS. It also has a rule to allow to star.google.com. So that should, that FQDN lookup should be allowed. Your idea is that the init container is going to use the host's DNS services. Correct? Hmm. Oh. Yeah, there we go. Like... That would not be. <laughs> so how's our pod looking now? Well, it's running now. So okay. is this why we're supposed to try and upgrade it? I'm just doing a, just changing the tag to v2 in hopes that that's a reasonable thing to do. We have an error. Failed to connect to database. We definitely saw okay. some policy drops between Postgres and things. Yeah. So let's take a look at that policy. There we go. Okay, Derry. Yeah. Well, it is policy denied. Wait, what? Cluster Fluid talking D. to a. What, what's that got so to do with Fluid So it's getting service selector here. Shouldn't redirect to those endpoints. It should be re redirecting to a different endpoint. That doesn't seem right. <laughs> do we so have? Can we take a look at the uh, service that this particular thing is targeting? What service is it trying to connect to? And let's look at the service for um, is it, it's the database Postgres. Uh, could you? <laughs> okay, I think. Okay. Uh, Wait could a you minute. Run... Let's look yeah, at this. This looks yeah, yeah. Big fan, big fuzzy hearts all over the place. I actually so, don't think you would find that one so quickly. So what we're seeing <laughs> here, job. yeah. So what we're seeing is that when in, when we do the Hubble observe, we're noticing that the clustered application, when trying to communicate with the database, is for some reason going to the Fluent D pod, and we're like, that's weird. Now there is a function in Cilium that allows you to do local redirect policies. So if you were going to do something like um, you had like a node local DNS cache, you know how you can use IP tables to like intercept the DNS traffic and send it to the node local piece. This is a mechanism that can also be used for that, but it's implemented in the eBPF where, where a policy might look like this. And that policy is basically saying that when traffic within this namespace happens, when something tries to reach the service Postgres in the default namespace on port 5432 and it's TCP traffic, we're going to redirect that traffic to a different backend using a local, a local endpoint selector that matches labels app fluent D. So basically in the eBPF, we can be like, 
don't send it to the Postgres database. Instead, send it to this other thing that is local inside of this namespace. Should we try the web page? See if the, see if the yeah. web page will refresh. Which one more? Boop. Oh, oh, they're they're broken. Oh, this is going to a code press. <laughs> Does does the pod have a matching label? Yeah, that's what we're looking. Looks that's different. Looking at. So let's take a look at the yeah. policy real quick. Got CNP clustered. That's what we know. So reading this, I'm looking for app app Postgres and app clustered. So if I did cube kettle. Or you could just do get pods show labels and see what exactly. all the labels are. See what they actually did call it. Oh, it's PostgreSQL. They got all fancy, yeah. <laughs> He's guessed it before it even happened. Well done. <laughs> but can we do the browser check again? Well done. Cool. The goal of clustered. The goal of Clustered is to see the dance, and they did great there. So these episodes are like nearly an hour long, so been able to condense that into six minutes. I hope you were able to follow along with the breaks, um, but it, it was a whole lot of fun, but well done to my surveillance. So if anyone has any questions about this, you know, feel free. We're going to try and get you a mic, and I've got a couple prepared here first, but if you do want to ask a question, just put your hand up. So Duffy, uh, Isovalent has gone all in on eBPF from replacing Kube proxy, removing dependency on IP tables, and more recently, Tetragon. Do you want to explain the buy-in for eBPF and what you're excited about by using eBPF on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, like, what's interesting is like uh, that variety of products actually describes the value in eBPF across a variety of different like uh, verticals, if you will, right? So with Tetragon, when we started talking about Tetragon, one of the amazing things that we're talking about is the ability to gather context about what's happening at the application layer and present it to you in a way that um, you can use it to understand what's actually happening, you know, like which given process is making what connect call, what system calls are they making, and those sorts of things. And then if you look at the way that we're using Cilium, we're using Cilium to leverage eBPF to solve a lot of the networking use cases, like how do we handle load balancing? Um, when we replace Cube Proxy, we're talking about using Cilium to be effectively like that internal load balancer that every Kubernetes cluster has, right? And so it's a, a variety of different really important use cases for eBPF. Awesome. What I really loved about our session was the developer experience, which we haven't got in that six minutes, but the videos will be available. But there was the Hubble UI, there was a Hubble CLI, there were Grafana dashboards that were shipped, uh, and even the use of the Cilium editor for network policies. So you seem to favor the CLI in our session, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about it and how people can also use the Hubble CLI. A little bit more about what, sorry? Sorry. This, the Oh, can you tell us about the Hubble CLI, why you enjoy using it, and what people can do with it? Yeah, I mean, for me, the, the part of it that is kind of amazing is that um, Hubble CLI gives you a view into what's actually happening at the network layer as far as connectivity and that sort of stuff. And so it's basically just a way of, of using a text-based uh, visualization tool that lets you see like event-based network connections between things. And in this age of microservices, where we're actually like, where there's a network between everything, like we need that kind of visibility to even know where to begin to troubleshoot, right? Like, because usually it's not, I, I mean, how often has it been an actual application problem versus that there's actually something on the network? Maybe you've misdefined a network policy, maybe you're, uh, you know, typed the wrong URL, you actually wanted to see like some kind of an X, NX domain that you, that you, you know, that it is actually DNS, but like some of the, some, this visibility I think is, is pretty killer. It's one, of the, it's one of the big differences. Awesome, thank you. Uh, did anyone want to ask a question about Hubble, Cilium, or, or to Duffy? All right, let's roll the next clip. Feel free to take it away, start typing, and uh, best of luck. Hello. So yeah, here we have the cluster, so let's see the nodes that we have before going on, so yeah. Okay, so yeah, let's check the pods that are running there. So yeah, it seems that the pods of the control plane of the, the cube system namespace are all running and good. So yeah, that's good for us. 
And yeah, we have this pot that is in crash loot back off state. So probably this is the one that we have to fix now. We can get the locks, so get the pot, the name of the pot. Oh. Okay, so let's describe this pot yeah. and see what we have there. I think, yeah, we have a oh. sec set con security profile there. So, okay. Yeah, if, if we have a permission, then I problem. Maybe this is related to, to SecCon. Yeah. Yeah, we have the, the annotation here. So. And it's a custom one, so that's suspicious too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I think we can use Inspector Gadget to understand what is going on with this SecCon. Probably what is happening here is that the pod is trying to use a syscall that is not allowed by the so in order to use inspector gadget we have to install this in in our cluster so yeah this is gadget audit set com so this is telling us that there is a pod running on this node the default namespace and this is in fact the pod that was crashing before this is the name of the process that I was trying to perform a syscall. Uh, this should be... Yeah, I'm a little bit confused by the output here. This system call is not part of the cluster spec, um, but it's not the reason the pod is crashing yet. Yet, at least. This is uh, two breaks <laughs> colliding together to cause uh, a very unfortunate side effect. But what else would give you permission denied if it wasn't a syscall? Well, capabilities. Yeah. All right, so we can trace capabilities. This should be good. OK, here we are. Oh, so we have it's security okay. contest capability drop all. Yeah, this, this is not good. We are it's running the pod without any capability, of course. This is going to fail. What we need to understand right now is what are the capabilities that are required by this pod. So, yeah, I think we can use the capabilities gadget to get a list of, of the capabilities that this pod is trying to use. So we have uh, QCTL gadget, dress capabilities. We are only interested in this one. Oh, here we are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Got it. That. And yeah, this is the name of the container, the UID, the PID inside the container. This is the command that is trying to do that. And this should be the capability that this is trying to use. So NetBind service. Does it look good to you? Mm -hmm. Looks good to me. Ta da! No. Yay. This is working. <laughs> it right. works. I mean, saying it's working is a pretty bold statement, but I mean, well, you, you can confirm running. that, right? We want it to curl from 30,000, local yeah. host 30,000. 30, yeah. We were trying yeah. to, uh, to verify that the application is working. So with this, this core. Doesn't seem to work. Connection right. refused. So there's, there's something else that needs to be fixed. So this is 30,000 here, and this should be... 8080. So what's the pot? Maybe we can list the sockets that are open in the pot to check what is the what is the real port name that the pot is using. I like how you don't ah. even look at the manifest to see if it's got a container port in it. You're like, nope, let's just go and list all the ports that it's using. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't trust the manifest. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try something. I think we can just trace the the whole namespace, and that should be fine. Oh, let me say gadgets here. Just deleted the pod. <laughs> okay. Oh. Oh, so. Seems demonic. <laughs> so, so it's yeah. port six six six, right? So okay, what we can do right now is to edit the service and change the port, I think. 
does this is why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Yeah. Nice try. Yeah. Okay, something doesn't work. <laughs> Another thing doesn't work. Your last break. I think somebody said before that SecCom wasn't the problem yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's... Yeah. And let's use that on the whole namespace. I think this is okay. I think what's interesting right, so about this is that Postgres traffic means your request has been received and the application is trying to respond. Okay, so yeah, it doesn't seem to be a problem with the networking because the traffic is arriving there, and the full connection is established. So I hadn't yeah. seen that TCP connect before, that's awesome. Okay, I'm sending a request now. It's shut down. Can you try to send another request, please, Iago? So I turn off the JSON output, so this is easier to read in this small yeah, terminal. Because, yeah, it is shut down. Uh, it was funny that you said that the JSON is easier to read. <laughs> 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 okay, so maybe we need to edit the the second profile. And because the shutdown is never called, the socket is never flushed, the response is never sent to the client. Let's do it in alphabetic order. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> right. right, and then the cube will apply the new second profile. Yeah. Yeah. Ta da! Oh, this is working. Yay! Right. <laughs> all right, so that was quite a tricky one. We dropped all the capabilities, we added a custom second profile that was missing one syscall. And I gave them a pod with no idea what port it was running on. So. <laughs> all right, so debugging Kubernetes is a, a huge challenge for all teams. Uh, but what I thought ama was amazing there is that you, you really didn't look at the YAML to see if there was a container port. You just listed all of the ports that the container was using. And I thought that was uh, very, very cool. So can you tell us a, maybe two of your favorite gadgets that you use and uh, why you like them? Sure. Yeah, so I think one of the cool things about Inspector Gadget is that it has like a wide array of things. And it has very simple gadgets like tracing the exec syscalls. And so you can see like if something is executing a command and it's not finding the command or whatever, you can see what's happening or like tracing the open files. Like these are very simple but very useful. But it also has like complex gadgets like the network policy advisor that can capture output and generate network policies based on the output captured. And so, yeah, I, I guess I like the flexibility of the different gadgets available. Awesome. So we use the custom SecComp profile there, and we are seeing more people adopt SecComp and apply them to the container images. But I think there's still a lot of frustration around generating those profiles. So could you maybe give us some tips and advice for doing that? Right, yeah. So we also have a SecComp uh, profile advisor that is just for that. So uh, you can run the advisor uh, like in capture mode first to see all the syscalls that your pod is making, and then just tell it to generate the profile, and it will generate a profile with just the syscalls that your pod is using. And you will have a matching profile, and you don't need to handcraft it, because like it just generates a profile for you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll just do questions at the end, and we'll move on to the, the next one, which is the Sysdig video. And I, I just want to say, like, I worked with breakers from all of these companies, and I've got to say, the Sysdig breakers really wanted to make you sweat. Like they, they really wanted to cause you some trouble. So exactly. <laughs> I can tell you that All your right. colleagues have left you some Falco workloads in the cluster. So we have five Salk QI. Yep. If you want to access the Falco Salk QI, I'm happy to open it in a terminal browser on the site just so the audience can follow along. I mean, right now it doesn't look so, like anything's broken. So yeah. <laughs> Okay. Fail to, fail to connect to database. Password authentication yeah. fail. There, there's also an image here in the page. <laughs> you can can we open it with the browser? Where is the chat? Oh, 
okay. <laughs> looks, okay. Looks like we're looks like we're upset. Um, should we go take a look what the uh, sidekick is telling us? If if if, tell, if we get any hint from uh, maybe any any Falco output first of all, maybe it's captured yeah. something. We have an, an exec into a pod. A DB Wait. program was born, and Bash history was deleted. Uh, a naughty um, person has been in one of these pods, I think. Schedule cron jobs. Hmm. Keep scrolling. Three times. Delete or rename history. Attach or exec in pod. Definitely somebody has uh, gone into one of these pods. Which one is it? Yeah, and there is a, an alter it's, user in the database. Mm -hmm. It's Postgres, right? There's also the password in the alter command. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. not today. So, the, so somebody, I think somebody, the wrong somebody went, somebody went into the Postgres pod and manually changed the password. Is that what they? Is that, that what they did? It's very cool that Falco gives you visibility into these arbitrary random commands within a pod. That's pretty sweet. It would appear the Postgres pod is running Nginx latest. Oh. Wrong image, but the Falco UI also said something. Uh, containers image Postgres 1.3 Alpine. So we have a meeting webhook somewhere. Those are nasty. Mm -hmm. I would maybe get rid of that. I mean, your Falco UI here shows you that the webhook yeah. QPNS is modifying all all container images to be Nginx latest. So I did it. I did it. I can do it now, right now. Just nuke it. Yeah, music and webhooks are, are pretty opaque. You don't know what they do. You just know the permissions they have. So we, we do have B1. So currently our application is working. Well, look at that. <laughs> so now you have to upgrade it to V2. Just do a dig with uh, uh, event dot type equal exec V, and we're seeing and, and we can see the executions in the cluster. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's some kind of hidden process probably somewhere. Uh, here, there's a process. There's a process code, definitely not. Yeah, that there is a question. Where, where, where do you see it? Or now that we need. What is that? What is definitely not? What is that? <laughs> It seems to be running not. date and sleep, and so, those are interesting. What if we just kill that process? We have the PID from uh, Sysdig, right? Try try just to do a Sysdig filter with a definitely prog name. Prog, prog name contains... Definitely. Definitely. Maybe let's try from Sysdig. Uh, but again, I don't know when the damn thing uh, starts, but let's try from Sysdig. And before the filter, do dash p proc dot p name. Can you there scroll is. up <laughs> in the meantime? Because there, there is the that clone. The yeah. clone should contain the parent too. Yeah, pt system yeah. d. It's system and d. The arguments. The yeah. argument is bar catch definitely not. So this is run by system D. Just kill kill dash nine system D. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kevin Pet so, one, that's a good way to do it. I kill the PID one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, guys, have you have you seen the Falco UI service there? Do you see that? Uh, I would like to check the service Falco UI, systemctl cat Falco UI service. Good call. There you are. Bar cat definitely, definitely not. not. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> not today. <sighs> So this that was nice. Loops forever 
checks to see if the pod is old and resets the password on Postgres. Good catch, Vicente. All you right. have to dance. <laughs> <laughs> so what was really funny about that is they had the bad code inside of a Falco UI service that obviously wasn't Falco UI, but they actually went to the extra effort of that bash script which was running every five seconds initially, and they said it's too noisy, they'll find it too quickly, and they actually made it check to see how old the pod was so that it only ran when they deleted the pod. Yeah, exactly. So we were trying to <laughs> capture it, but it wasn't happening <laughs> often enough to, to, to actually be able to see it. Yeah, it was very it, nasty. They put a lot of effort into that, so that was a, a lot of fun. And we see mutating webhooks a lot on Cluster. They, they are very opaque, they're difficult to track down. So it was actually really cool to see Falco with Sidekick and the UI actually give you visibility into what was happening and that, which was kind of cool. So something that I often see is that security is still kind of considered like a day two problem. But now that we have tools like Falco coming in and becoming adopted and there's ability to share rules, um, do you see a shift changing there where people are starting to maybe work on security earlier? Um, yeah, for sure what we're seeing with Falco. So uh, Falco, is to attempts to accomplish two goals. One is uh, the use of uh, modern techniques like eBPF to capture data that is as granular and as real time as possible from the operating system and from other sources as well nowadays. And the other one is creating sort of a simple policy language that uh, people can use uh, really in a community way. A strong belief that we have in the Falco community is that uh, um, you can uh, have a chance to win the war with the bad guys only if all, all of the good guys can get together, you know, on a single platform. And a way to, for example, create security policies that are built on top of a simple language that is working on top of eBPF is one way for the good guys to work together. And for sure, we're seeing, you know, people to are incentivized essentially to to produce policies and rules that then become a value for the whole community. Do you feel that like we're on the path to there being a secure by default rules or policy that can be deployed to our Kubernetes clusters? From one point of view, I would say uh, we're going toward the direction. From the other point of view, it's also constantly a challenge because because security is always it always environment dependent right so building something that works out of the box for everybody is the dream and definitely with every iteration of security tools we're getting better and better but i don't think we're there yet uh, with something that just works out of the box you know for everybody and is secure by default Okay, right. I'm going to throw this out to all of you now and maybe we can have a bit of a conversation. But I think what's really cool here is that we've seen eBPF applied to networking, security, debugging. You know, it's almost a superpower that anybody can learn and harness and use. So do you have any tips for people here that want to adopt eBPF? And uh, let's try and tackle that as consumers of eBPF tools, but also as being eBPF developers. So any tips and advice for people? Uh, I don't know, uh, I can go first. Uh, in my opinion, uh, so eBPF is uh, a super cool technology, incredibly powerful, uh, and I recommend to anybody to learn more about it. It's such a, a powerful Swiss army knife, but uh, at the same time, you don't need to be like a compiler expert, a kernel expert to take advantage of this. What we saw in this panel, what we saw today, is that uh, there's a bunch of tools, Cilium, Falco, uh, that uh, expose this kind of functionality in a way that uh, doesn't require you to be a rocket scientist, but still allows you to take advantage of this. So start maybe from the tools, learn the tools, and then use them as a way to go deeper and actually learn how it works. Yeah, I completely agree with that with that direction. I think that um, you know, even earlier today, we saw a talk about leveraging um, Pixie and and some of the um, and some of the capabilities of just leveraging BPF trace, right, to understand what's actually happening on your systems. 
I mean, as a system, I'm, I'm an old systems administrator and I've worked in networking for years and years at this point. And I would say that for me, the easy entry point into BPF and starting to learn and explore what it was, what was possible was playing with those tools, right? Like being able to use BPF tools that um, kind of already existed in the community to like look at the set of problems that I'm used to looking at in a different way, you know, getting more context presented maybe at a higher abstraction, right? Being able to understand, you know, what system calls were happening at the same time as the networking problem that I am having was happening, right? Like being able to kind of like widen my perspective with these tools. Yeah, it's, it's that's definitely, I think, a good place to start. Yeah, I agree. I, yeah, I'm not sure I have much to add, but earlier today, there was a plug for Liz's talk uh, from last year, so. Uh, for those that were not there, uh, that's like a good introductory talk. And I think the BPF trace uh, is also a great tool to getting acquainted with like, what are the different trace points that are available? What kind of things can I do? And you don't know, you, you don't need to learn all of eBPF to just like start experimenting and do a few cool things that maybe are not particularly useful, but it's like the first taste, it's like a hello world that you can then move on to do something more interesting. All right, thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions for our panel? No? All right, well, I hope you all enjoyed that taste of Clustered. Thank you so much to the panel and the breakers and the fixers. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you. Thank you.